It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It is very expensive to be poor. Imagine for a minute that you're not protected by this amazing union. You work at a low to minimum wage job and your hours are unpredictable. It's a struggle each month for you to make it from paycheck to paycheck. You don't have a bank account because one, most banks have abandoned your low income neighborhood and two, because you don't trust them anymore because they charge punishingly high fees for minor mistakes. Without a bank account, it's hard for you to save your money. Not only that, but you have to pay to turn your paycheck into cash and then your cash into money orders to pay your bills. You would be one of the 40 million unbanked Americans who spends 10% of your income just to be able to use it. To put that in perspective, that's how much these families spend on food. Now imagine a different scenario. Like nearly half of the US population, that's right, half, you have less than $500 in savings. With such little savings, you feel like you're always just treading water. This month you stumble, your car breaks down, you need $500 to repair it. There's no way you're gonna make it this month. You don't wanna get evicted and you'll do whatever it takes to feed your kids. So what do you do? You get a small loan to recover from this financial setback. Where can you go? The reality is, even with a formal bank account, the underbanked cannot get loans from traditional banks in their moment of need. Instead, their only options are payday lenders, title lenders, and other fringe lenders. These, what we call them modern day loan sharks, charge rate, that are totally legal, by the way, charge rates of 300 to 2,000% APR. So even if you needed $500 this month, by the time you've paid off the loan, you spent about $2,000, and you've been sucked into a cycle of debt, trying to pay, take out one loan to pay off another. Not only does this crushing interest make it difficult for you to ever pay it off, it will probably end up ruining your credit and may result in your bankruptcy. So you were looking for a lifesaver to get you through the month, but what you got was an anchor that submerged you further into debt. Whose fault is this? I sometimes hear people say that those who take out payday loans just need financial education so that they can choose not to take out these loans. But this assumes, of course, that people do this frivolously, that they have lots of options. They do not. It's not that the low income are choosing to borrow because they don't understand that these loans are costly. They understand just fine. They actually have nowhere else to turn. Banks are no longer interested in small loans. So what I see as a banking scholar is a disparity in banking services today. We have a mainstream, regulated, federally subsidized banking sector that serves the wealthy and the middle class and a wild west hodgepodge of unregulated lenders that, survive, that survives by um, being sharks on the low income. Right? They're profiting from people's misery. So how did we get here? Over the last 30 years, there was a merger wave that swept through the banking industry. And today we've got five or six banks that dominate that industry. So basically in a decade or two, I don't know if you're familiar with It's a Wonderful Life, but Bailey's Bank not only got swallowed up by Potter's Bank, but then even Potter's Bank got swallowed into Bank of America. So once the community banks left, they created banking deserts. And who filled them? but payday lenders. So as community banks are dying, our society is still stuck in this myth that only community banks can serve the poor. Every law enacted over the past 30 years has focused on trying to induce community banks back into these areas, but they're not interested, and they can't do it anymore. It's too financially difficult. So I think we've got a large problem and we need a large solution. Many people are also thinking that the solution lies in some new technology, right? Financial technology. And certainly that will move us along, but it's not a replacement for traditional banking, which is saving and borrowing money. Why? Because banking requires trust. Trust is the currency of banking. Banks operate using other people's money, and for this to work, you have to trust a bank. So since the beginning of banking, 
Until today, the only institution ever in any country across the world that has been able to provide trust and allow banking to exist is the federal government. We can innovate around the details, but the essential government-bank relationship hasn't changed in hundreds of years. In other words, when it comes to saving and borrowing, you would rather do it at a dusty, old, government-backed institution that's been around for hundreds of years and will be around in another hundred as opposed to some nimble startup. This is why I think instead of just looking for the future for an answer, we may want to study the past for what has worked. And it just so happens that there's a large national government-backed institution that exists in every poor community and didn't leave when all of those banks left. Guess what it is? The US Post Office. In fact, that's right. In fact, the US Post Office served as a bank for much of its history. The US Post Office predates the United States Constitution, and it is not an overstatement to say that the Post Office built the foundation of our democracy. In 1792, our founding fathers, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, um, James Madison made uh, the Postal Banking Act, or sorry, the Postal Act, we're not there yet, of 1792 and made several crucial decisions that remain today. One is that the post would be financially supported by Treasury, it would be self-sustaining but not profitable. That one's diminished a bit. Two is that every community would be served without regards to profit. And three, that Congress would subsidize, at the time, the dissemination of newspapers. So the merchants that were, that were bringing money into the post office would subsidize information flowing from east to west. So when de Tocqueville comes to the United States to marvel at our democracy, he says it's the post office that made it because a logger in Michigan could read the Washington um, goings on of Congress just as well as someone in DC could. That, that was done by the post office. So the first proposal to open postal banking comes in 1871 by President Grant's Postmaster General. But as is often the case with banking, in order to get anything done, we needed a crisis. So after the panic of 1907, Teddy Roosevelt endorsed postal banking right away. In 1910, um, uh, President Taft took up postal banking. And so in 1910, we got postal banking in America. By 1913, the Times declared it already a success. It got 13 million, 32 million in deposits within two years, mostly from immigrants. In, starting in 1930, as the Great Depression took root, hundreds of banks were failing across the country. So where did those deposits go? To the safest place possible, to the postal banks. So every year of the Great Depression, the savings in the postal banks doubled each year. But FDR chose FDIC insurance as opposed to postal banking in 1934 to stabilize the banks. But what happens? We've got two world wars and a huge mounting debt. So FDR says, we're gonna start selling war bonds through the post office. And we raised $8 billion to fund two world wars and the Great Depression debt from the post office. So Americans in the 1940s were saving through these postal savings stamps, war defense stamps. Uh, um, even school children would be saving through their postal savings accounts. So we had a savings culture. Part of it, part of the reason for this was because it was so easy to save at the post office. By the 1950s, um, this changed. As the soldiers started coming back home, uh, community banks were undergoing somewhat of a heyday at the time. And so because the legislation capped what the postal banks could offer on deposits, right, Congress wouldn't let them offer that much returns, the community banks started taking an, um, ha having an advantage. So in 1966, President Johnson abolished the postal banking system, and the only dissent at the time were the big unions. So postal savings died a quiet death here, but it's important to remember that postal, saving, postal banking was America's most successful experiment in financial inclusion. It brought in a culture of saving and provided safe banking for much of our history. So this historical view is important because in a lot of ways, unfortunately, 
our society resembles 1910 more than 1966, when every community had a bank and there was more um, income equality. So what if the new solution to our new big problem is actually an old one? So I think we need to return to a system of postal banking to eliminate banking deserts and leave no American unbanked. This is an institution people trust. The post office is not a shark. This stability is crucial to promote savings. In fact, 60% of post offices are now in banking deserts, those long abandoned by banks. And because most of the unbanked still use cash, they still need a physical location to put their money. That's not to say that they would remain in cash. Once a customer opens a checking account, they would have a debit card to use to pay their bills. The days of paying high fees just to use your money would be over. Imagine again that you need $500 this month, except now you can go to the post office, who's not trying to profit from your desperation. Instead of paying 2,000% interest, you can pay 10% interest. I suspect that if anyone can offer a safe loan, it is this public institution that is so crucial to our democracy. In addition to its long-held mission of public service, the post office has lower overhead costs than banks and payday lenders because it already has existing personnel and brick and mortar. So it's got natural advantages plus the public serving mission. So today in America, the poor pay more for credit and financial services than anyone. That is fundamentally unfair. The less money you have, the more you pay to use it. And so while offering a, the poor a place to save their money will not cure poverty, it will help provide a lifeline instead of a crushing burden in people's time of need. And there's no better institution to do this than the trusted government institution that helped build our country still manages to deliver mail to every household in the U.S., regardless of cost, has a branch in every neighborhood, and is still geared to serving the public. So the post office may be struggling to survive, but millions of low-income Americans certainly are. And postal banking could breathe life into both institutions. So I think it's a win-win that we really need to uh, bet on. So thank you very much.